George Olson sold us the house, and he's white. He didn't have a problem with it, neither should they. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to today's program. I'm guest host today for an important interview. The topic is the play, Not in Our Neighborhood. Pleased to have the authors of the play. Eric Wood is the co-writer and director of the play. His colleague, Tom Fable. Tom Fable, co-writer, actor, uh, former political activist in St. Paul as well. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Let's jump right in. Uh, not in our neighborhood. It's a phrase that rings loudly whenever you say it. Uh, what does it mean here, uh, Tom Fable? Well, what it describes is a, the central event in this play, which we have. And the central event is uh, a, a, a profound effort by the uh, citizens and the residents in the McAllister Groveland neighborhood to prevent a very distinguished African-American couple from moving into that area in 1924. So that's the, the central event. Uh, the, the, the larger event that is the play is just how distinguished these people were, both mm -hmm. of them leaders in their community, mm -hmm. tremendously accomplished people, uh, people that should be known just for everything good about their lives. Uh, as well as this very awful incident that they went through in 1924. But yeah, not in our neighborhood was the effort by the neighbors to keep this very distinguished couple from moving from their home in Rondo into the McAllister Groveland neighborhood. So Eric, tell the story. What happened with them? How did they come to make the decision to move from Rondo? It, it was, uh, I, my, my word right now is, uh, my favorite word is serendipity. They just uh, decided, they lived on, on uh, St. Anthony, in fact, Old 606 St. Anthony, mm -hmm. which has now been, which is now gone due to the highway uh, mm -hmm. uh, running through the neighborhood. But um, they just decided they wanted to move mm -hmm. to a new location, a new home. So and describe so they, the family. Describe them first. What was their circumstance? Who were they? Well, Who were they in community? You know. In, in my mind, they were the 1920s equivalent of uh, Barack and Michelle. Classy people. They were classy people. Educated they were people, well off. He was uh, a very successful uh, lawyer. He was the leader, um, uh, the, the word uh, law team, he was the leader of the, at that time, Negro uh, division of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She helped foster the uh, uh, suffragette, she was part of the suffragette mm -hmm. movement. Although black mm -hmm. women at that time, when it went through, didn't get elected, but she was part of that movement, mm -hmm. uh, uh, of that force out that saw that. And she, uh, she uh, engineered the anti-lynching bill uh, following uh, the lynchings in Duluth and, and, and elsewhere. Um, they were both talented. They sang, they performed recitals, mm -hmm. uh, they were playwrights. They were actors. They were very prominent in the community and uh, are actually members of Pilgrim Baptist Church. And their names? Uh, uh, William T. Francis and Nellie Griswold Francis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And lineage-wise, were they first-generation St. Paulites, or had they been here uh, uh, for no. a generation before, or were they immigrants? Yeah, more uh, more Nellie less? came from, uh, Nellie originated in Nashville. Mm -hmm. uh, Billy, as we like to refer to him. Now, I'm not sure where he came from. Uh, Southern Indiana. Southern Indiana, okay. okay. Um, and, um, but they, they came here. They met at the old, uh, the, it's a Northern Pacific, was it Great Northern? No, I forgot. I think, I think it was Northern Pacific. I think that's right. It's Northern Pacific. He, uh, he started out there as a clerk. Um, messenger. Or a messenger, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, bec and became chief clerk at Northern Pacific. Uh, Which means it's a legal position. He, he, he was a lawyer. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And he, he, was, uh, he rose to prominence there within uh, the Northern Pacific legally and, you know, and became 
chief clerk there. Uh, and she was in the, she worked in the office. She was a stenographer. Stenographer, yeah. that's the word, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, yeah, they were they were quite prominent, quite well known, invited to many um, uh, events uh, uh, to speak. They were they were invited to to speak at many events at churches at, yeah. at, at many. Describe St. Paul back in that era. Describe Rondo in particular. What do you know about the general energy, the, the feeling of being part of Rondo and part of uh, coming up? At that time, at that time Rondo, Rondo was pretty vibrant. I mean, they, you know, that community within a larger community, um, something that we wish for now. Uh, but you know, they were, you know, there were clubs, there were, I, I think you're acquainted with the old Krejifan uh, Club, the Sterling Club, um, and a number of other clubs uh, that were active and, and, and active socially. Um, it, was, it was just an active, vibrant community with their own stores and, and things like that. And but it was a small community. It was a in small community. In terms of the size of St. Paul, I think we calculated one time based upon the 1920 <clears> census, <throat> But 1.4 percent of St. Paulites at time that time were African American. Yeah, I don't remember what. About 2,400. Was that 2, it? 2,400 yeah. people. Yeah. yeah, so it was yeah. a small community. Okay. okay. And how did you all come to the story? What is it that sparked? Uh, how did the story present itself to you? And how did it become your cause to create this play, the play not in our neighborhood? I want to defer to you okay, because well. I think I think the chronology yeah. works works better that way. Yeah. I started, I'm on the board of the Ramsey County Historical Society. Uh, we pr turn out a, a quarterly, sometimes a bi my annual magazine, which is a pretty good one, called Ramsey County History. And you're a lawyer too, right? I'm a lawyer too, okay. yeah, that's right. In the uh, winter of 2017, our magazine had an article on William and Nellie Francis. I, I'm not quite sure what the name was. But it, was the, it was the central article in the magazine written by a historian by the name of Paul Nelson, who's done quite a bit of historical writing in the area. Uh, to read the story, uh, I read it very soon after it came out, there are two things. One, this re re incredibly uh, accomplished couple, leaders in the community, leaders in St. Paul, brilliant people. Uh, in, in, there's a story by itself that should be known as you read it, but then juxtaposed to that was this incident in 1924 when despite the fact that they were the Barack and Nellie Obama uh, Barack and, and uh, Michelle Obama of their era, uh, the neighbors went to enormous lengths to prevent them from moving in, including violence, including cross burnings. So it was the juxtaposition of those two things that just stuck me in the stomach, Al. I, I grew up in that area. I grew up in the McAllister Groveland area. Nobody had ever heard about them. Never heard about them in the first place, which was a shame. But moreover, never knew about this history of profound segregation mm -hmm. that was attempt, being attempted to be preserved by the, by the area people in the, the McAllister Groveland area, which we think of as a liberal part of St. Paul and, and you know, in an area that we assumed was open to racial diversity. And just to, to learn that it wasn't was shocking to me, appalling to me. And I, I immediately turned, reached out to my friend here, Eric and I have been in the theater before. I said, Eric, you got to read this story. And, and we got to, we, there's, there's, an, there's a play in this. Yeah. Well, it's as shocking as the lynchings in Duluth yes. because oh. you simply wouldn't expect it and you wouldn't expect that um, visitors, itinerant uh, performers, artists uh, would be lynched in Duluth, but it happened, right? And so there's a lesson here. The lesson is that even where we think uh, we have friends and openness and uh, the ability to be civil, Sometimes there reside pockets of hostility and actually ignorance that uh, can be detrimental and life-threatening. When the adversaries here, the people that tried to prevent them, they, they, you know, these weren't just rough old people on the street who were fighting up with some, some itinerant workers. These were the, the neighbors who were living in this new neighborhood, business people themselves, uh, people of accomplishment. So, so, so what did you hear? What do you say? In, in your, I'm taking your play as a reporting assignment as well, and what have you reported were the comments of the neighbors who resisted uh, their movement into uh, this neighborhood? It's interesting because what we did, this whole thing, uh, not, uh, Paul Nelson's input notwithstanding, 
it prompted us to go to the History Center and do some uh, research, um, you know, microfiche research. And uh, I mean, the deeper we, I mean, there were all sorts of articles about them. We researched uh, the Pioneer Press. We researched the, the community newspapers, the, uh, the, appeal. the appeal, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, there, seemed to, there seemed to regularly uh, be something about uh, William Francis or Nellie G. You know, they had, I remember, I recall, and I, I recall these, these in, in, in the more uh, uh, current newspapers too, what's going on within, mm -hmm. with, with, within the neighborhood. They, they seem to be regularly mentioned there. Probably Esther Bradley Peake's columns. Yeah, she was the could have been, yeah. Uh, right. um, and uh, so, I, I did kind of lose my thought. thought um, so what, the, the question was, what was said? What did the neighbors, what kind of words and language and Oh, okay, so Here's they, the most dramatic one they, we came up with. There was an article in the St. Paul paper after the, after the second cross burning. Okay, the first cross burning took place before they had actually moved into the home, uh, attempting to give the message to them through their cellar that they shouldn't do this. They moved in anyhow. After the second cross burning, there was an article in the St. Paul newspaper where they quoted a, a man who a couple times appeared in the paper as the leader of this organization, an organization that had a, a, a petition of 300 names on it to keep them from moving in. He was quoted in the paper as saying this, the, the KKK only burns two crosses as warnings. The, the implication being the, the, the third time the house is coming down. Mm -hmm. we, we, we picked up on that tone, yeah. that, that, that the tone was that harsh, that it was that direct, that it was that hateful, that spiteful, to give words to others that we brought into the play, and others whose names we had because of a letter written by Billy Francis to the NAACP. We had some names of others. We brought them in, we put words in their mouths, but that was the speech that gave us an idea of yeah, the, the, the tone yeah. of, of the way in which these people were talking. How intense and how vicious uh, this resistance was. Did you use actual people's names in the play? Yeah. You did? And what are their descendants saying? What are they saying? I, I mean, I don't know if any of them are still around. Yeah. 24, I, some might still be around. They, you know, I haven't heard anything. I don't know that, yeah. that you have, but uh, we did hear from the new uh, owners of the house, yeah. the house that was in question, 2092, uh, Sargent, they came to the play to see, and they had no idea that the house was uh, historic. Unknown, in that yeah, way. historic. Yeah, yeah. and um, uh, so I, I, I've got to piggyback a little bit on Tom uh, in terms of the inf information we drew and how it impacted us. Much, in fact, all of our all of that play is based on what we drew out of the history of this thing. Uh, and one of the most, one of the things that uh, impacted me and will stay with me forever was the postcard, was a postcard that the Francis received uh, upon their move into the no, new house. And the postcard said, put a beggar on horseback and he will ride it to death. And that impacted me, given the whole aura of what, of what was going on there, and just the, just the antipathy, you know, the the resistance, and and you know, and the other thing was that um, uh, Oscar Arneson was a clerk. He was a he had the state legislature. State legislature. He was a clerk of the state legis chief, legislature. Chief clerk. Yeah. Chief clerk. And he, he was that for six years. He, three terms. He served three terms for the legislature, yeah. and for him to behave this way, um, it's it's just. Yeah, we he was in three, leadership. Three names. Three yeah. names that we that we identified. At one <laughs> point in time, uh, the supporters of of William Francis, specifically an officer of the NAACP, uh, by the name of Valdo Turner. He was a doctor in town had written to the national office and saying, we need some support here, we need some help. And they had written back and they asked Francis, William Francis, to give them a chronology of what happened. He wrote this four page letter that we hailed. Okay. We got it from the, actually one of the historians yeah. had gotten it from the NAACP. In that letter, he named 
Well, Arneson, of course, whose name we also had from the newspaper, and he gave three other names that were the, his aides. Well, we looked up those last names. Arneson we knew, and we knew where he lived, down, down on Berkeley Avenue in St. Paul. Of those three other names, we looked up their last names, and we found two neighbors along Berkeley Avenue with those last names. So we think that's a pretty safe bet. The fourth one, the name, it wasn't close enough, and we didn't name him. He was up on McAllister Street, which you know, is eight or nine blocks away. Sure. But we used the three names, Arneson, and then Greer and Haas. Who, and we, Eric and I have gone and seen their homes there, mm -hmm. just right down the block from where Arneson lives. Did you talk to them? Do you meet them at all? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. This, this is 1924. You know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no. well, they're gone. Yeah. Presumably. Yeah. But we, didn't hear from, we didn't hear from any, any uh, descendants of no, any of them. No, none at all. <laughs> I, you think they'd be keeping and their heads There wrong. was some discussion of that prior to. Yeah. But uh, we elected to just, sure. you know, it was accurate. It, what, it, it really shouldn't have reflected on, I didn't feel it should have reflected on them, you know. I, I'm Al McFarland. My guests today, Eric Wood and Tom Fable, co-writers of the play, Not in Our Neighborhood. It's a work that's being presented at Minnesota History Theater downtown at uh, Cedar and Ninth. Uh, it's available, I think, uh, on a run between till, till the 21st of, of March, but also uh, from uh, to April 12th, I think. Yeah, April yeah. 12th. March 12th of 2020. Yeah, of 2020. So it's yes. being scheduled, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. great. So you know, when you get the story, and the story grabs you and then compels you to write about it, what discoveries do you make? What discoveries? What findings uh, do you both experience in the in the exploration and the development of this story? What, what hits you, what grabs you? You've mentioned a couple of things that you said are, are seminal, but as you do this research and as you try to put pen to paper to bring life to this history, what grabs you? I assume that I was more shocked by this than Eric was. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a white man. I, I'm a white man who's always made certain assumptions about my community of St. Paul we never seen this kind of behavior. I wouldn't see this kind of behavior, obviously. Uh, I didn't believe that it existed. I didn't. I had no idea that that this kind of deep-seated, not just prejudice but hatred, existed in our city in, in the neighborhood of the town where I grew up. Eric and I went to Central together. We didn't see it in, in our era in the 1960s. At least I didn't see it in, in our era of the 1960s at Central. Uh, so it was this realization that. These northern bastions, which we've always assumed were open to to racial diversity, that were were didn't suffer from the from the from the horrors of the Jim Crow era, that didn't suffer from the other horrors that African Americans were suffering elsewhere in the country during that period. For me to learn that it was here, and that people did suffer, and that, that some of the same hatred existed here that existed elsewhere. That's what I've learned, and it's, it's been very eye-opening, Al, very eye-opening. How about you, Eric? What do you think uh, you pulled out of this experience of doing the documentation and, and writing and presenting it? Well, what I, you know, again, I was, I, I, what I was drawn to, and, and, and historically, I, I'm from, uh, I'm a product of a group of families that, uh, that adopted uh, Hillary's it takes a village to raise a child uh, scenario. And the adults that raised us, our parents, were accomplished in their own right. And this is in the 40s and 50s coming up. But they, they dealt with all of this stuff. You know, my, my father was one of the first uh, rail car stewards uh, for the Great Northern rail, Railroad. And he was up against it when he wanted to become a steward. Uh, uh, Leroy Coleman, one of the first uh, fire department camp captains, uh, Jim Griffin, uh, the same, uh, it, and it goes on, there were four or five. And I will, I will say this, as a kid, when the adults got together, uh, and, and we did, it was on a regular basis, every, every couple of months families would get together, kids would play and have fun, and, and they, they would you know, do what their adult thing, but I would listen to them, and they would talk about stuff that they had to face, I'd, I'd sit aside and listen to that. So, so from that aspect, um, 
I, Tom's right. I, I wasn't that surprised because I knew the history. What I tended to focus on, and, and that's the way I wrote, because I wrote the, the Nellie and William uh, uh, dialogue, was that the sense I got that they were really a team. They were really connected. Um, and they really, they really took this thing on together. And so it was, that's what struck me was the cohesiveness uh, 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 about them in the face of all, all the racism. That's really what I drew. I, you know, I'm kind of a simple kind of, you know. You know I... so, so it sounds to me like uh, in the creative process, uh, if you're writing Nellie and Williams, Bill's parts, their voices, uh, you went through a process where their voices inhabited your mind, sat Correct. on your shoulder and spoke into you, Correct. and then you, and I'm presuming that you uh, sort of were the host for the narrative. Well, the and I story. also put in the words of the bad, uh, the people yeah. that were the, the hateful, spiteful people saying bad things. And so what, how, what the, are the discoveries if you had to channel that negativity, uh, what did you discover about humanity and even about yourself? That's, that's a great question. About myself, it was too easy to write. Oh, yeah, that bothered me. Mm -hmm. We lived this too. I, I lived in the south side of Chicago in the late 60s. We, I went to law school down there. So I, I, I've, I've heard people talk. I, I've heard people say, well, I really don't have anything against him. It's just that He's not right for my neighborhood. I just, we don't, wouldn't mind having black neighbors, but that would hurt our property values. I've heard those things. Yeah. I've heard those things. So, so, and, and I've heard people talk. I, I don't take them to be horrible people. I take them to be people who are of their time, who had horrible attitudes, who had learned that through history, and which had to be expunged through our history and hopefully are in, the, are in the process of being expunged through our history. Um, but uh, I, I think I, I, I've learned, I was a prosecutor. Uh, uh, I used to, every once in a while, look in the mirror and say, there but for the grace of God go I, uh, to recognize that that could have been me in 1924, uh, in other circumstances. I, I see that, that evil within all of us, I see, I see the rejection of the other in all of us. It's, it's in this soul as well. Uh, and it's something that I think all of us have to deal with. Let me bring this thing forward to, to today, to uh, 2019. Uh, all of us are right now grieving uh, from afar the uh, uh, senseless murders in New Zealand. Uh, that on top of uh, the ongoing unfolding of gun violence, racially driven uh, animosity in this country, in Europe, kind of around the world. And you would hope that if we were talking about something in the 20s and 30s, by now as human beings, we would have advanced. I question whether we have advanced or not. When you even look at this story in the context of today's headlines, uh, what are you thinking? What do you feel? Well, I'm thinking that it remains, it remains relevant. This isn't ancient history. Uh, we, we say that in, in our script. This is a story that people need to hear now. They have to think of the way in which the lessons are applicable to today, and we all have to be looking inwardly at ourselves and trying to root out anything in, a, in our hearts that could contribute to this kind of an atmosphere. Eric, you talked about how the elders would gather and uh, have fun, do adult stuff, but what they were really doing was being the village, mm -hmm. that the village was a real deal in our community. And I think what happened here, you mentioned some of the luminaries, great men and, and women that made up uh, St. Paul's Rondo community. Mm -hmm. Those communities and those pockets of community existed in black culture throughout this country. Yep. Uh, where are we now? And the fight that they brought, uh, I think the uh, this family endured and persevered because there was a network mm -hmm. that stood for some principles, right? right? And that was courageous. Mm -hmm. Are we still there? Have we continued to maintain that, that grasp on possibility and belief? Uh, what do you think? Well, that's tough. I, you know what I say? Part of it's been lost. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm out of the civil rights movement. And I tell people, you know, the civil rights movement, you know, MLK, 
uh, Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, they're a generation away from, removed from, over a generation removed uh, from the kids. And I, I remember, I remember uh, just, just thinking about that, considering that, you know, when the, the fad was, what, 20 years ago, the kids were wearing the X hats, mm -hmm. the, the baseball oh, caps were there. And, and, and um, I thought, I, I just want to, I, I asked myself, do they really know the import of Malcolm X and really what he meant to the civil rights movement, to our movement, to our, our getting ahead. And I think, that, I think that's been lost to a degree. I, not completely, I, you know, it's, it's taken on kind of a different dynamic. But I think we, we need this, this point of reference. And I've been quoted as saying, saying that. You know, we can't move forward we, we don't dwell on history, but we certainly need a point of reference to keep moving, moving forward. It's the thing that propels us in my mind. And so I, I think this play is important for that very reason. We need, that, we need this point of reference. Well, let me ask you to uh, invite uh, people to connect with you all. Uh, how do ordinary people, number one, embrace this story, get it, read it, enjoy it, but also use the model that you've created to examine our own neighborhoods and our own histories. What do you think? Well, one thing I think we could say is this, Al. We've had discussions after several of our performances. We, we had five sold-out performances at the Landmark Center, and we had a nice crowd for another performance in a, in a church that was right in the neighborhood where this took place. Uh, and we've had discussions after those performances. And people have really embraced the issue. They have, they have talked very meaningfully, black people to white people, white people to black people, about the, the, the significance of these issues ongoing, uh, the need to continue ad addressing racism, uh, the, the, the fact of the racism which hasn't been acknowledged uh, to the degree that it should be acknowledged. Uh, so we, we feel that in many respects we have helped to, to advance that discussion, to open that discussion among people that hadn't been in the part of that discussion before. We, we had probably 1,500 people see our play already, uh, which we're excited about, and we're, we're very happy that it's had that reception. That's 1,500 people that are part of a discussion now that may not have been part of that discussion before. We think that's a good thing. I think it's a great thing. Listen, this is a, uh, time goes so quickly, but thank you both. Uh, Tom Fable, Eric Wood, uh, co-authors of the play, Not In Our Neighborhood. Uh, it'll be being presented in 2020, right, at the Minnesota History Theater uh, in downtown St. Paul. But uh, reach out to them, because you might find the two of you in churches or in communities uh, making this conversation. I tell you the conversation's important, and I thank you for the insight that you have brought to the discussion and to the uh, courage that you give people to tackle a difficult topic. So thank you so much. Thank you, Al. Thank you. I'm Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. <laughs>